Rock Kranz, and I'm happy to introduce to you our next talk, uh, which is by Anthony Downey, uh, followed by a conversation with Moitza Kumerte. Although regularly presented as an objective view from nowhere, artificial intelligence perpetuates a regime of Western power that maintains neo-colonial violence. This is evident in the technological evolution and martial development of AI in unmanned aerial vehicles and lethal autonomous weapon systems. Programmed into such systems, the operative and rationalizing logic of algorithms is complicit with reductive determinations of what constitutes life and death in conflict zones. Predicating the ascendant black box logic of AI the historical evolution of autonomous image production continues to be central in, if not fundamental to, these processes and standard operating procedures. Anthony Downey is professor of visual culture in the Middle East and North Africa at Birmingham City University. He sits on the editorial boards of Third Text, Digital War, and Memory, Mind, and Media and is the series editor for research practice at Sternberg Press. His recent publications include Topologies of Air, Shona Illingworth, uh, published with Sternberg Press and The Power Plant in 2022, and forthcoming ones include Post-Digital Futures and Algorithmic Anxieties by MIT Press. He's the cultural and commissioning lead on a four-year multidisciplinary A HRC Network Plus Award, where his research focuses on supporting cultural practices, digital methodologies, and educational provision for children with disabilities in Lebanon, the occupied Palestinian territories, and Jordan. Moitza Kumerde is a prose writer and freelance publicist, and among other things, she published the short story collections Fragma in 2003, and the novels Temna Snow, and The Harvest of Kronos for the publishing house Belletrina, and the novel Glucha Saba in 2022 for Goga. Her prose has been translated into many languages and is included in several Slovenian and foreign anthologies. Kumarde writes about art, science, and culture, occasionally takes part in contemporary dance and theater performances, and also collaborates with Slovenian intermedia institutions. And with that, uh, I'd invite Anthony to the podium. Thank you. Rok, well, thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking uh, the team at Axima, Janesh and Marcella. Uh, thank you for the invite. It's a great pleasure to be back in Ljubljana again. Um, so, what I'm going to be talking about today uh, represents about two or three years of research, uh, some of which has been published some of which will be published over the next six to nine months. But the majority of it's going to be in a book that uh, Rock just mentioned, which will be published hopefully in September of 2024. So I'm gonna give an overview of, you know, maybe one or two chapters of that book, but equally talk about uh, my own research interests through that. And I guess I wanna put forward two or three key points here today. Firstly, uh, the technologies involved, the AI technologies involved in lethal autonomous weapons and unmanned aerial vehicles, they not only perpetuate technologies of vision, colonial technologies of vision, they propagate new regimes of visibility and invisibility. And I want to talk about that in, in depth, actually, because I think that's the core of my argument. And I want to make a distinction, and the distinction is as follows. Whereas colonization was largely to do with the extraction of wealth, labor, and resources. Neo-colonization, while obviously continuing those ambitions, is more involved with the extraction of data. And that extraction of data, that, that logic, that imperative of extractivism, is being increasingly used to build better AI systems. And by build better AI systems, I mean build better apparatuses of disciplinary control that are driven by one imperative and one imperative only, to better predict the future. That is the goal of AI. That is the goal of artificial intelligence, to predict the future. 
Now, I want to make a further distinction there because this is not just about algorithmic rationalizations predicting the future. It's also about occupying the future. And I mean literally, materially, corporeally, occupying the future. And I want to take this through a bit of context because I think context is needed to fully understand the implications of this. And that context is largely to do with colonial technologies of vision, specifically those involved in cartography, not least triangulation mapping and cadastral mapping, cadastral mapping being the mapping of terrain or topologies for the purpose of determining ownership. When you can join that colonial technology of vision with the evolution of, for example, photogrammetry in the 1860s and 1870s, you have a very powerful disciplinary technology of vision. You can join this with aerial surveillance in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, and you lead to an era of what Harun Faraki called operational images. Prior to Faraki, of course, Willem Flusser referred to these images as technical images. These are images produced within an apparatus of vision. They're increasingly about the devolution of ocular-centric sight, our sight, to machines. But they're not just about the devolution of sight. They're also about the relegation of decision-making processes. They're about handing over decision-making processes to machinic apparatuses. I want to take all of that and suggest that we've now entered into a new era. And that era is an era of algorithmic rationalization or an algorithmic aperture. And I take this notion of an algorithmic aperture from Louisa Moore, the idea that the world is being increasingly seen through algorithms and their rationalization of statistical data. This algorithmic aperture is increasingly giving rise to data-driven killing apparatuses. That's to use Jutta Weber's phrase, the notion of data-driven killing apparatuses. And I want to look at this in more specific terms. And what I want to argue is that this is not just about AI and prediction. This is not about the predictive function of AI. This is also about how the predictive function of AI summons forth threat and in some cases hallucinates threat into being and how that logic, that pathological logic or illogic of an algorithm is complicit with the notion of the military preemptive strike, the whole martial logic of preemption. How does AI prediction and, and military preemption come together and collude to create what I would refer to as a phantasmagorical space where threat is always present, about to happen, on the horizon, and implicit in any rationalization of time and space. I'll just remind everyone of a rather infamous remark by George W. Bush in June of 2002, when he said, if we wait for threats to materialize, we will have waited too long. Now, that's an extraordinary statement because what he was doing there was basically outlining U.S. military policy, not forgetting nine months later the Allied forward slash U.S. invasion of Iraq in March of 2003 ushers in a new era in kinetic and non-kinetic warfare. And that era is fundamentally driven by the predictive function of AI and its summoning fort of threat, not just its prediction of threat, its summoning fort of threat. And I guess the one thing overall that I want to look at is how the epistemic structures, the knowledge structures, the taxonomic structures of AI are used to affect real violence in the so-called real world. So let's look at a few examples and we'll take that for a walk. This is January the 3rd, 2020, the assassination by a predator drone of General Qasem Soleimani. Uh, many of you will remember this. Uh, this was Baghdad City Airport. Uh, Qasem Soleimani, a uh, very powerful figure in the Middle East. He was the major general of the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guards, but also the leader of Al-Quds. Uh, second only in command, I would think, to the Ayatollah. Uh, he was assassinated in a so-called decapitation strike. A decapitation strike in a decapitation drone strike is when the target is known, as opposed to a signature strike when the target is not known. This is an example of a decapitation strike. This strike was a preemptive strike and totally illegal. Not much has been made of it, but it's totally illegal. To actually strike someone on the basis that they may or may not present a threat in the future is illegal under international law. However, the reason I'm bringing it up here today, and you know, we can debate the legalities or illegalities of decapitation drone strikes, but I'm bringing it up today for a simple reason of how it came into being 
and on very fundamental sort of logistical terms. To begin with, there would have been a pattern of analysis or a pattern of life analysis which would have been gathered over a period of months, potentially years in uh, the case of Soleimani. This would have been most likely performed by an MQ-9 predator drone which has a surveillance and strike function. This data, once gathered, would be collated, archived, and then gathered into data sets which would be fed through machine learning and deep learning systems to predict the future movement or predict the future threat level of someone like Soleimani. This would have been conjoined with biometric data analysis, so you'd have a whole biometric system, potentially social media, it's not known. In fact, I doubt Soleimani ever used social media, but social media is certainly part of that substructure. This would have also been conjoined with human intelligence, so-called human, that's on the ground intelligence. And that would have predicted at a certain, amount of, certain moment in time that Soleimani represented a imminent, if not foreseeable threat. Let's shoot forward, November 27th, 2020, so about uh, 10 months later. This is the decapitation strike, drone strike, on uh, Moshan Fakhri Zadeh, Iran's top nuclear scientist. He was assassinated on a road outside of Absard, which is east of Tehran. Uh, he himself, not much is known about this man, obviously very top secret, but he was assassinated, and the immediate aftermath of this was quite fascinating. The Iranian intelligence service and FARS, the semi-state uh, news system, said that he'd been killed by a robot. Uh, and then there was reports about uh, 12 people dying in a shootout between um, Israeli forces, Mossad, and uh, Iranian forces. And then they said he'd been killed by a remote-controlled robot from space, satellites. Needless to say, this was laughed at at the time, and there was a lot of debate around this. And this went on for weeks, back and forth, back and forth. I'm sure many people in the audience remember this. However, it turns out that that's exactly what did happen. Uh, he was assassinated by a remote-controlled robot that was being controlled by a uh, satellite. Now, nobody has taken claim for this assassination, but if you look, there was a video released last year, Yossi Kohn, who's the ex-head of Mossad, more or less admitted that it was Mossad who assassinated, assassinated uh, Fakhri Zadeh. How they went about it is quite interesting because it represents uh, an entire break with what we understand to be uh, lethal autonomous and autonomous weapon systems. Firstly, his route was algorithmically defined, data was extracted, they knew exactly where he was going, or at least they thought they knew where he was going. They parked a blue Nissan Zemyad, a very popular car in Iran, at the side of the road. As he approached this, a uh, FN mag, this is a Belgian-made FN mag machine gun, which was attached to a robotic apparatus, algorithmically determined where exactly he would be in that road, and also algorithmically allowed for the recoil on the actual machine gun to compensate when it was firing. So what you have here is quite an extraordinary setup. You have data extracted about this individual, a pattern of life analysis, biometric analysis, don't know about social media analysis, but all of this analysis is extracted, and then a statistical analysis of threat is made through an algorithmically rationalized apparatus. He is then assassinated on the basis of this when the opportunity arose. Now, What's interesting about this is that if this is all the case, and it's pretty much proven that this is the case, this is the first known use of a remote-controlled unmanned ground vehicle to affect a targeted killing. In this instance, a decapitation strike, he was known to the so-called enemy. So again, these systems are creating, to use Jutta Weber's term, data-driven killing apparatuses, systems that kill. But something else is happening that's quite interesting, and I'm giving you some examples of semi-autonomous lethal weapons in use. This is when a human in the loop is still present. A human can still interject to make a decision whether or not somebody dies or lives. This, however, buried in a UN Security Council document, is possibly the first evidence we have of a fully autonomous lethal weapon being used in a theater of war. And to give that some context, this happened north of Tripoli and in a little, little town, and there was a skirmish between uh, a number of soldiers. And when you go in and read about this skirmish, and again, it's, it's, it's quite buried, and I don't know if you guys can read that, I hope you can read it, but it reads the following. The lethal autonomous weapon systems were programmed to attack targets without requiring data connectivity between the operator and the munition. In effect, this was a through, far, forget, and find operation. <laughs> 
Now, this is quite extraordinary because what you have here is a fully autonomous weapon. The first example, the first known example of a fully autonomous weapon. That weapon in question was a Cargo 2 Turkish made drone, and it was literally set up. It went, it found, without any prior programming, the target and potentially killed that target. Now, the UN report gives this very short shrift, but this is representative of a complete shift in how we understand the autonomy of lethal autonomous weapons. Shoot forward, August 29th, 2021, the week of the pullout of the US Army from Afghanistan, the egregious pullout of the US Army from Afghanistan, leaving many, many, many thousands stranded. Um, in that moment, there had just been an attack on the airport in Kabul, and it was obviously a fraught place to be. This is Zamari Ahmadi. Zamari Ahmadi and nine members of his family, including seven children, were effectively killed in their compound in Kabul. They were killed by a Hellfire missile that was fired from an MQ-9 Predator drone. This drone was controlled from al Udaid Air Base in Qatar. This was an OTH strike, an over-the-horizon strike, whereby there would have been a pattern of life analysis, there would have been a biometric analysis, and there would have been research into who he was, potentially, and what he was potentially. And it was defined through that research, through that data extraction, that he was an affiliate of ISIS. And he was involved in, or about to be involved in a terrorist attack. In the days after that attack, General Mark Milley stood up and said this was a righteous strike. Now, of course, what transpires through the New York Times uh, inquiry into this, an excellent inquiry, if anybody hasn't read it yet, I would suggest reading it is that he wasn't an ISIS affiliate. He was a UN health worker and indeed had been delivering aid and his pattern of life analysis was erratic because he was dropping off food and picking up colleagues. However, pattern of life analysis, biometric analysis, all of this analysis predicted that he was a target, not just a target, but an ISIS affiliate. He and nine members of his family, including seven children, were effectively killed as a result of the statistical probability that they were involved in, that he was involved in terrorist activities. I should say, he was also driving a white Toyota Corolla. This is one of the most popular makes of car in Afghanistan. Very, very popular make, very popular color. However, this car had been followed for three, possibly four days prior to his uh, killing. I want you to remember that when we go, come back to look at how neural networks uh, process images. So let's reverse and go backwards. This process of data extraction doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from a long historical lineage of extraction of data. And I would argue that colonial technologies of vision have been implicated in precisely these levels of data extraction since at least the late 18th century. And I think as my starting point, somewhat arbitrarily, uh, Napoleon's colonization of Egypt, 1798 through to 1801. Now as a result of that, he developed and produced between 1809 and 1829, his Description de l'Egypte, which is an extraordinary document in itself. It's 29 volumes, and we're going to look at that very briefly. But when you think about this cartographic mapping of the Middle East, this extraction of data from the Middle East, you have to also think of it in conjunction with photogrammetry. And I'm going to look a little bit more in depth at that. Photogrammetry being precisely about the abstraction of data from a real-world event or edifice and the replication of it through photographic means. Conjoin that with the evolution of aerial surveillance, specifically in the Middle East, and I am looking only at the Middle East. I consider the Middle East to be historically a testing ground for Western technologies of vision, and I think it's instructive to look at how those technologies of vision have been e evolved throughout the history of Western involvement, colonial involvement in the Middle East. Briefly look at some of these maps. Through my research, uh, I found the following uh, despite the fact that what you're looking at is an aerial view, uh, Napoleon, there is no evidence that he brought anything that would have been able to create these views. There is evidence that he brought Montgolfier balloons, but never used them. Now again, uh, what you're looking at here is an imaginary view that's been extrapolated from the ground up, and it's this view from above, effectively, uh, is what you're looking at. And remember that when we start to look at aerial surveillance. This is Description de la Egypte, 29 volumes, extraordinary document, extraordinary sort of apparatus, discursive apparatus that sets out to not only detail 
the Middle East, not only represent the Middle East, but produce the reality of the Middle East. And of course, this is Edward Said's argument in, throughout Orientalism. Now again, thinking about that as a discursive technology of envisioning, of bringing into being a reality. Again, I think about this against the backdrop of what we are now living through in an era of algorithms, the way in which algorithms summon forth realities. Very briefly, uh, again, just thinking aloud, thinking about some of the influences on me, thinking about uh, Anders Engberg Pedersen's book, Empires of Chance, when he talks about the cartographic apparatus for Napoleon and the generals was a means of visualizing and managing the future. Now, this managing of the future, uh, I, I, again, I want to take this for a little bit of a walk today and think about the way in which managing the future produces, uh, for want of a better term, phantasmagorical spaces these spaces of fantasy, that whole colonial investment into the phantasmagoria of threat, imminent threat, everlasting threat. I mean, that's still with us today in the so-called war on terror. And again, thinking about Derrida, Derrida writing about modern technology, contrary to appearances, although the scientific increases tenfold the power of ghosts, the future belongs to ghosts. Now again, I want to re remember that when we talk about algorithmic hallucinations the way in which there is a psychopathology associated with algorithms whereby they, as a product, as a systemic product of their convoluted neural networks, produce hallucinations. Moving from this, I'm thinking about photogrammatic surveying, the structuring of space, time and space from an aerial view, the way in which photogrammatic surveying is being predicated in these cartographic processes, these triangulation mappings that you see in Description de l'Egypte. And then start thinking about aerial surveillance. Think about the evolution of aerial surveillance being a means to control, manage, and indeed predict future events on the ground. These are some of the first images of Palestine and Syria from the Matson collection. And I should just give a bit of a shout out here to um, my friend and collaborator, Heba Wayamin, who introduced me to this collection, the Matson collection. When Heba and I were looking at this as part of the book, uh, a number of things became immediately apparent to us. And one of those was that this cadastral mapping, this mapping for the purpose of deeming ownership, or indeed denying ownership to land, was not only involved in a geopolitical quartering of time and space, it was, to all intents and purposes, predicating what we are now living through in relation to the algorithmic rationalization of time and space. Moving on from these structures and just thinking about the relationship of cartographic cadastral mapping, aerial surveillance, and somewhere in between you have photogrammetry. Now photogrammetry, as I'm sure many in the audience know, is a, uh, it's a photographic process to begin with, but it is about the abstraction of reality from an edifice and the reproduction of that reality through photographic means. And it takes on many different types of um, technologies and many different iterations and manifestations. And it's increasingly, of course, in our age of CPUs and GPUs, one of the driving forces behind the production of realities, inverted commas. But I'll just remind everyone uh, that photogrammetry plays a key role in Harun Faraki's work, or at least his explication of the evolution of images, in particular operational images. And I'm sure you will remember from the outset of his film, The Images of the World and the Inscription of War, where he describes from Meidenbar's diaries an incident that happened with Meidenbar, whereby he was measuring the Wetzler Cathedral in a basket attached to the side of the building. And at one point, it looked like he was going to fall out of this and meet his debt. And after that event, this life-changing event, he set about constructing a separate apparatus that would enable him to measure a building without getting close to it. He would take a photograph of it, and all the measurements of that building would be taken from the photograph. So right at the heart of photogrammetry is not only the devolution of ocular-centric sight, that is, you looking at something, there is also the relegation of that sight into an apparatus or a technology of envisioning reality. Something else at the heart of photogrammetry which interests me, and that's its interrelationship with the notion of destruction. This is Meidenbar's photograph of the French uh, cathedral in Berlin in 1882. This is the French cathedral in Berlin in 1945, following the Allied bombing. Following that bombing, the entire cathedral was reconstructed using Meidenbar's 1882 photographs. 
So right in that moment of capturing a specific reality, there seems to be an order of destruction. And I think this is an interesting thing in and of itself when we think about the way in which algorithms capture reality, the way in which they rationalize certain realities. Because right in there, as I will continue to argue throughout this talk, is a phantasmagorical threat or a, a phantasmagoria of destruction, imminent destruction. I'm going to move that on and just start taking all of that and take it forward and think about Harun Faraki. Think about everything we've just spoken about up until now. We can still imagine, we can see. It still has an ocular-centric component to it, largely speaking. Faraki's evolution of the operational image brings us into an entirely new realm. These are images made by machines for machines. They are not made for the human eye. Not only are they not made for the human eye, they are made for operational purposes. They affect realities. Now, again, I see this as a kind of historical context that is behind the sort of algorithmic aperture, how algorithmic apertures increasingly devolve the ocular-centric. But not only the ocular-centric, we cannot see an algorithm in operation. We are largely a mere component, if not just a programmer, for that system. But in that moment of devolving our sight, we are also devolving responsibility for the impact and legacy of an algorithmic aperture. And as I said earlier, that algorithmic aperture can and does indeed give rise to data-driven apparatuses of killing, to use Jutta Weber's phrase. Just to remind everyone, should you need reminding, um, again, Faraki's notion of the operative or operational images, he used the terms interchangeably. These are images that do not represent an object, but are rather part of an operation. Again, and this is the work of Volker Pantenberg, who's written a lot about Harun Faraki. What I'm interested here is that any notion of the operational image is almost an oxymoron. They are not images. They do not exist as images. They may exist as vectors or binary systems. They may exist as gradations of light, but they are not images. When we do see an operational image, an operational image in operation, this is usually just a compromise. The computer, the computer system, an algorithmic system, compromising and showing you for want of a better term, how it works, so that you can check, cross-check, and recalibrate its systems. How does this all work in relation to an MQ-9 Reaper drone? Now again, thinking about these systems, thinking about the devolution of sight, thinking about the abnegation or disavowal of responsibility for what these systems do, you enter into a black box realm with drones. These black box systems are for want of a better term, relatively impenetrable, but not totally impenetrable. And I think we need to deconstruct what exactly is meant by a black box system. These black box systems are black boxes for the very simple reason they are military, industrial, proprietorial, contractual obligations, not to let you know how they operate. But we do know, to a certain extent, how they operate. This is a multi spectre sensor used in an MQ-9. This is a graph, for, just for illustration purposes, of how it operates. We don't fully know how it operates. Of course, it's a closely guarded secret, but we do know certain elements of that operation. Now, crucially, in the last five or six years, we know a hell of a lot more than what we used to know about how these systems operate. This happened because of the chaos and, I, I guess, controversy, uh, controversy around the so-called MAVEN project. The MAVEN project was a US Army project to begin with. It was announced in 2017. They said they would be working with various corporations and governments, sorry, various corporations, to affect image processing and image identification systems that operated through algorithms. Of course, it transpires in 2018 that the company in question were Google, and I'm sure many in the audience remember the Ferrari around this particular uh, event. Now, fascinatingly, what comes out of this, of course, is a real thorough insight into how the Pentagon were using AI Firstly, the Pentagon were delivering to Google in airtight conditions, off-grid conditions, video footage from war zones in Afghanistan and Iraq. This was then being trained to a tensor system to identify certain objects, but not only identify those objects, but predict the threat level of those objects. Now, Google withdrew from that project from internal and external pressure, but I just want to remind everyone here today, lest you have forgot, that Project Maven still exists. And in fact, it not only exists, but is driving the entire kinetic and non-kinetic theory of war that lies at the very heart of the Pentagon. The people who took over 
Project Maven are uh, a rogues gallery, if I may. You have Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google, who's very embedded with the US Army, with the Pentagon. Peter Thiel, venture capitalist, one of the first investors in Facebook, and the originator of a company called Palantir. Uh, some of you might know what Palantir means. It was an object that was used in the Lord of the Rings to make predictions, and of course, that's what Peter Thiel's company does. It is based primarily on the notion of AI as a system to make predictions. Third member of this group is, um, let me get the name right, there's two of them. This is James, James Murdoch, scion of the Murdoch family. So again, an extraordinary uh, kind of conglomeration of people and one of the companies behind this, as I mentioned, is Palantir and Peter Thiel. If I may, uh, I would recommend that the audience go and read Alex Karp's letter to the US military just published in February last month of 2023. It's basically a love letter to the Pentagon saying, you know, you need me. You need me so much because what I've got for you will define not only how you dictate warfare, but how you will conduct warfare for the foreseeable future. It's an extraordinarily blatant letter in and of itself. And it's worth going into the Palantir site and looking at how they present these technologies and look specifically at the text deconstruct those texts because they're saying something quite extraordinary in those texts. And I'll just read very briefly. Uh, new aviation modernization efforts extend the reach of the Army intelligence, manpower, and equipment to dynamically deter the threat at extended range. That phrase, dynamically deter, I can't help but think about George W. Bush in 2002. I don't think this is about dynamically deterring anything. I think this is about auguring, bringing into being, summoning forth the reality or unreality of threat to consolidate the martial logic of a preemptive strike through the predictive logic or predictive logistics of algorithms. And I see the two of them as in direct collusion with one another. Again, just going back very briefly to this, what's the technology that lies behind it? And this is where things get a little bit more interesting. I'm sure you know that machine learning and deep learning, the origins of machine learning and deep learning in computer vision and machine vision originates in Frank Rosenblatt's uh, development of Perceptron 1. This is Mark 1 system, which was an IBM 704 five-ton beast. This was the first computer that could see. Uh, Rosenblatt used punch cards, which he placed in front of uh, these light altometers, also known as potentiometers and they would correctly predict whether a market being placed on the left or the right. But of course, they were not foolproof, and they made many, many mistakes. And if you want to follow through on Frank Rosenblatt, go back and look at Walter Pitts and Wayne McCullough's paper, A Mathematical Calculus of the Neurological System, published in 1943, because that's the basis of his perceptron system produced in 1958. This is the beginning of what we understand to be neural networks. This is an artificial neural network whereby you input, you have a hidden layer, singular layer, the perceptron was a single layer artificial neural network, and you'd have an output. By output, we mean correct prediction. Now, as I said, and as Frank Rosenblatt states in both of his papers, this is a matter not of certainty. This is a matter of statistical separability and probabilistic models. What he's saying there is that yes, through these artificial neural networks, we can predict with certain statistical and probabilistic and stochastic degrees of certainty the future, but we cannot always predict the future. Now that brittleness right at the heart of neural networks continues to this day, despite the fact that neural networks have obviously came a long way. Instead of single layer systems, you now have systems which work on multi-million layered systems. Convolutional neural networks, CNNs, and generative, uh, generative adversarial networks often work on millions of hidden layers. Now I use this example because it brings back the Toyota Corolla that Samari Ahmadi was driving on August the 29th, 2021. When you feed an image, a data set, into a convolutional neural network, it will go through hidden layers and give an output. Then by a process of backpropagation, you will facilitate or not facilitate the error level. So basically, the system begins to learn for itself. It can learn to a very high degree and predict what that input image is. It can equally learn to a very high degree and predict new images, but it cannot do it with 100% certainty. Which brings us back directly to Zamari Akhmadi. What precisely happened in that moment? 
what precisely happened in the pattern of life analysis, what happened in the biometric analysis that led up to the fatality and the deaths of 10 people on August 29, 2021. Now, when you dig a little bit deeper into it, this becomes, to me, a bit more interesting for all the wrong reasons, because every single report into the death of Zamari Ahmadi, including the New York Times investigation, which is a fantastic investigation, a very thorough investigation, all puts it down to human error. And you can read this uh, as it's up on the screen. Every single excuse given by the US military to date has been down to human error. At no point in any of the investigation by the Army or the New York Times has anyone mentioned the systemic, systematic error that lies at the heart of neural networks, that lies at the heart of predictive mechanisms in AI. Now again, thinking this through in relation to what's happening with pattern of life analysis, thinking it through in relation to what's happening with biometric analysis, what we've got is a system which is not only brittle, but even the people who are computing, the people who are generating these systems have very little knowledge of what actually happens interior to the black box apparatus itself. So we've not only devolved the ocular-centric event of vision, our vision, we've also relegated any decision-making process and reduced ourselves to mere calibrators, if not programs, of systems over which we have no control. Now again, I'll just remind you that this is still continuous, despite the fact in the leaps in AI, despite the facts in generative AI, such as ChatGPT, DALI, MidJourney, it still is about probabilistic and statistical analysis, not definitive analysis, and you cannot as we all know, on the basis of past events, predict the reality of a future event. Just to bring that into further uh, uh, sight uh, and put it under a bit more of a sort of a microscope, not only do you have a situation where you cannot predict the future, but these systems are prone to hallucination, as I said at the very beginning. Here's just but one example, and I could give you 20 examples, where a neural network has decided to 99.9% .9 certainty that an object is one thing when it is obviously the other thing. And in this instance, it saw a turtle as a rifle, and the red here represents its certainty that it's a rifle. Another example of this is so-called fooling images, the way in which fooling images can be generated in neural networks, where again, they give you 100% certainty that this is what they are looking at, but in reality, what they're looking at is a random uh, dots and pixels. One of the reasons the US Army have never totally invested, sorry, one of the reasons they've never totally let loose lethal autonomous weapons is that you can instill fooling images into these systems. These systems can be made to turn on themselves. And this is one of the big worries that the US military have about the use of algorithms in uh, lethal autonomous weapons. So I'm gonna finish up. Again, just returning to Derrida, the notion of these systems, technologies, new technological systems producing ghosts. I just want to replace the word ghost with phantasms or phantasmagorical spaces, spaces of hallucination, the psychopathology of algorithms, the psychopathology of neural networks producing these phantasmagorical spaces of threat. And again, thinking through the evolution of this from cadastral mapping, aerial surveillance, through to photogrammetry, through to technical and operational images, through to the algorithmic aperture. I think it enables us to start to think about what really is being said in this moment. Because in this moment, what's being said is that we will kill you whether or not you're a threat. Because if we wait for you to become a threat, then we've missed our opportunity. That's an extraordinarily tautological logic, but it's also an extraordinarily fatal logic. I would also point out General Michael Hayden's statement in 2014, we kill people based on metadata. So they kill people based on a potential hallucination. I'll finish by saying the following. I see these apparatuses, I see them as apparatuses, and I was very taken by Giorgio Gambon's notion that an apparatus must always imply or imply a process of subjectification. That is to say, they must produce their subject. These AI apparatuses produce their subject. Those subjects are the disciplined subject, the subject of threat, the subject of imminent threat, the subject of an always impending threat. And of course, that's precisely what Said was saying in 1978 when he published Orientalism, the way in which Orientalism is a discourse produced the reality that it purported to be describing. What reality was it creating? I always defer here to Amy Cesar in Discourse on Colonialism, published in 1959, 1955. Colonization equals thingification. Now, Cesar was talking about a time 
of uh, thingification as a, the, the, the body being seen as a natural resource. In our time, I think colonization is producing the datafication of the body or the data fiction of the body, which is producing a, a regime of thanatos, a regime of debt, imminent debt, ever impending debt, or to use another term, the necropolitics of debt itself. So that's me, but I would just leave you with the following thought. We have looked largely at fa fatalities caused by drones and the notion of fatality debt seems very final, but the reality of these systems is not just about debt. The realities of these systems is about inducing trauma on widespread populations. Hyper-surveillance through lethal autonomous weapons and unmanned aerial vehicles are producing evolved forms of trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder amongst huge swathes of populations and communities across the Middle East. That trauma is not just about the present. That trauma is about controlling the future. And the sort of algorithmic rationalization that you see about predicting threat and the military imperative of preemptive strikes effectively collude, not just to predict the future, but to occupy those futures. And those futures are traumatized futures. Thank you. So, Thank you, Anthony, for a really inspiring uh, lecture. And I would like to start, uh, what are the reasons for art artificial intelligence start to hall hallucinate? Uh, you, were, you have been mentioning brittleness uh, being in the heart of neural uh, networks. So my, also another question is, how is it possible to strengthen to make more powerful, powerful those neural uh, networks? Um, uh, yeah, okay, how would, we, how would we take that brittleness out? Um, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, in fact, this is precisely why the likes of um, OpenAI have been given 10 billion by Microsoft uh, to make their systems better, effectively. I don't know whether you can take this brittleness out and I can get technical and give you the reason why technically you can't take it out. Um, but we'd want to ask another question, perhaps. Why would we want to take it out? Because that would suggest that these systems could one day work. Now, at least at the moment, we have a setup whereby we know there's a problem with these systems. Whether it's admitted or not, by the likes of Palantir, there is a fundamental, profound, systemic problem with these systems. From the very inception in 1958, these problems were known. These problems have not went away, they've been magnified. Now, it's one thing to have chat GPT or DALI or mid-journey, that's all very well, uh, that predictive generative AI. It's another thing when you utilize those systems in apparatuses that affect life or death, or control life or death, specifically in zones of conflict. And for me, um, the, the, the question is perhaps not so much about can you take the brittleness out, but what would happen if you did manage to take that brittleness out? because effectively we would enter into a new era. Perhaps that's a more disciplinary era, perhaps that's something which is much, much more about controlling uh, every single movement, every single event, and not just the present and past of that event, but the future of that event. Because if you can predict that future through systems that actually work, then that opens up a whole new dystopic era. Well, in the field of, uh, uh, in, uh, of weapons, as I understand, uh, this word of hallucination, instead of this word of hallucination, is word unpredictability in the field of autonomous uh, weapons. So uh, if especially uh, fully autonomous weapon is unpredictable, for what sorts of uh, strikes or tasks then would be used? A fully autonomous weapon? Fully autonomous, yes. Uh, I, I, I could imagine, for example, the technology that you saw in the Cargo 2, which was used in Libya, being used to effect further decapitation strikes. And it might not just be individuals, it could be groups of people. Um, it's interesting that the entire evolution of this new era of AI has came about more or less contiguous with the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, 
I'm sure many people remember, um, in the early stages of that war, there were um, a number of incidences involved improvised explosive devices, IEDs, and this almost caused the US Army to pull out of Iraq because many of their soldiers were being killed because they couldn't predict where these IEDs would be. So the Pentagon invested billions at the time in a system called Argus, A-R-G-U-S, and Argus was set up with a singular function. Uh, its singular function was wide area motion imaging and wide area aerial surveillance, WAMI and WAS. Uh, that was the algorithmic extraction, sorry, it was the extraction of data and the algorithmic extrusion of that data to predict where IEDs could potentially be. Now this basically kickstarts an entire era of hyper surveillance, hyper surveillance specifically of that, of that area. But what interests me about that is over that 20 year period, uh, the, it's not as if, that technology has obviously got better. And as a result of that technology getting better, occupation does not necessarily have to be physical. Occupation can be virtual. And the virtual occupation of entire regions, the hyper surveillance of entire regions, is firmly embedded in the evolution of AI today. Uh, you're the, a member of Airspace Tribunal, which was found uh, 2018 mm -hmm. by Shona Illingworth and other people around. Uh, Shona Illingworth is the author, I mean, is the, the artist uh, on which is based the book, uh, 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 The Topology of Air, that you uh, were edited. Uh, so, uh, my question is uh, in which stage is this? project now, and uh, what are the le legal recourses that uh, you propose, mm. as I understand you, that you're going to propose United Nations? Mm. Um, so, um, the Airspace Tribunal is a five-year project that has just ended. Uh, it was five tribunals. I was part of the Toronto Tribunal, where I gave evidence around AI, similar to what I've given here today. And the purpose of the Airspace Tribunal is to gather a dossier of evidence related to threat from above, from airspace, through lived experience. So many of the people who have been subjected, for example in Gaza, the occupied Palestinian territories, Syria, to indiscriminate forms of drone surveillance and drone violence, lethal autonomous weapons, uh, they have given evidence to the Airspace Tribunal. That evidence is being collated and will be published in two special issues of Digital War, the Journal of Digital War, and will be presented to the United Nations later this year for them to consider as part of their development of a new human right. And that human right will be firmly implicated in the notion that everyone has a human right to be free from threat from above. And that threat obviously relating to uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, a war in Ukraine has been very much accelerated the development of uh, AI weapons and other systems. Many argue that Ukraine is a texting ground uh, for how old weapons can be used or deployed together with uh, cutting edge technology. So um, how much uh, and what sort of uh, weapon is, I mean, I'm talking about this new technology, is used in, on both sides in the war of Uc in Ukraine. Yes, uh, I've been following that very closely, as I'm sure everyone has. Um, Iran are obviously supplying Russia with very, very primitive drones. Uh, these drones are not, to my knowledge at least, and if anybody knows more about it, I'd be interested to hear, um, they're not even semi-autonomous, they're extremely crude. They're aimed in the general direction of a city and they explode in that city. Uh, they are a munition to all intents and purposes. Their, their, their sole function is to create terror and terrorize populations. Um, as far as I know, uh, the, 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 the systems are still relatively primitive compared to, for example, the Cargo 2, the Turkish-made system. And it's interesting that Turkey, and I doubt that the Turks would supply weapons, given that they're a member of NATO, to Russia. Interestingly, there's a lot of debate now about what the Chinese will do. 
and I'll just go back to the talk earlier about uh, semiconductors in relation to Taiwan and that whole geopolitics of the relationship of the US to China being more or less, yeah, it's a trade war, and yes, there has been tension, but a lot of it's about who owns semiconductors and who has the right to produce semiconductors because that will power data going forward. But to my knowledge, the Russians do not have that level of, um, of, of, of technology. Interestingly, the Ukrainians at the very outset of the war used drones in a very, very creative way. They would send up drones as technologies for seeing, and once they would see tanks, for example, they would call in uh, a missile strike. For, so it was used in a very productive, very pragmatic purpose. But to my knowledge, AI has not played a huge part, or let me rephrase, AI has not played a defining part in this war yet. Do you have any information, I mean, non-official information, that also um, little uh, autonomous weapon was used? Not to my knowledge. The only example that we have is that example mentioned in that very short paragraph in the United Nations Security Council document. That's the only known example of a fully autonomous lethal weapon being used. That's not to say that there aren't, there are always gradations. Uh, there's a loitering munition. Uh, the Israeli Defense Force have developed the IAI, have developed a thing called a harpy. That's a semi-autonomous loitering munition that once set up can make decisions about who to target and when to target them independent of a ground operator. But it's still semi-autonomous because it's programmed to track a specific area where potentially a threat has been isolated. So it's still a semi-autonomous weapon. How many countries uh, are able to, to produce uh, uh, autonomous uh, weapons? Not many. The leading proponents of this are the US, the United Kingdom, China, Turkey, Israel, and um, I think they're the, the leading proponents of this technology presently, which is not to say that other countries have not been developing similar technologies, potentially covertly. The, Isra the, the Iranian example is an interesting one because obviously they do not yet have that level of technology. And from what I know at least, their drone technology is still relatively um, primitive. Since 2017, uh, many civilian uh, initiatives and also states around the world, especially states from the first world, uh, they have been trying to ban the autonomous weapon. Mm. Well, unfortunately, uh, in Geneva in 2021, um, um, all big powers, superpowers were against it, but not, not only superpowers, also uh, states uh, that they are producing artificial intelligence systems and uh, uh, that kind of technology. So, um, what do you think, uh, how close or far we are from uh, banning uh, the, um, the autonomous weapon. I shall, uh, I, I shall also uh, add that um, in 2021, this proposal uh, was um, sent to um, convention of conventional uh, weapons uh, at United Nations in Geneva. That was the place and the context, yeah. Mm. I genuinely don't know. Um, is it, just to clarify, the question is how far how away far are we? How or, far or, <clears throat> or, or close we are for banning... For, for banning... Banning the, uh, the autonomous weapons. I'd like to say we're close, but... Uh, what had to happen? What would have to happen? Yeah. A major fatality uh, on the scale of the seven-mile nuclear accident or Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. Something like that would have to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you would have to have uh, a widespread massacre brought about by drone weaponry, a lethal autonomous weapon, or that weapon turning on its own um, mm -hmm. people, the aggressor, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, if that did happen, and uh, I think there have been examples of that where it has happened, these systems are not foolproof. They're the fail-safes, okay, there were many fail-safes, but th they do fail, and when they fail, uh, the potential for widespread fatality and death is enormous. Um, what we looked at there were individual incidences, but uh, effectively, you can 
potentially imagine a scenario where there's a complete system breakdown and something fatal happens, at which point, potentially, you could get legislation in place. But I think we need to move away from that slightly and think about what's happening presently. And at the very end there, and I hope it wasn't too rushed, I, I could see Marcella holding up the placard telling me I'd run out of time, but, <laughs> thanks Marcella. <laughs> it's, it's what's happening now. If we, don't re if we don't engage with the extent to which hyper-surveillance, not just fatality, but hyper-surveillance is inducing forms of hyper-vigilance and evolving forms of threat in entire populations. That's where I think we need to place legislation, the human right not to be under imminent threat of debt and fatality. If you think about what that does to a body, if you think what that does to a psychology, if you think that how that rewires your sense of being in the world, that in and of itself I think is where legislation needs to be placed. And we need to understand that this is not just about traumatic events surrounding death and fatality in the present. This is about how these technologies have effectively occupied the future trajectory of these communities. It's occupied their imagination, occupied their fear, their ambition, their desire. Uh, the very modality of being in the world has been calibrated towards imminent death by drone. Well, for the end, is there any question from the audience? Maybe? Yes, please. Hi, my name is Nate Spocher, and um, basically we speak Slovenian because of a guerrilla fight in the Second World War. Um, is there a, a, a kind of guerrilla fight you can fight against AI, which is, of course, um, heavily connected with um, lots of um, capital, so to speak? Talking about, for example, a small balloon, a Chinese balloon, and a, a big um, plane trying to destroy it. Thank you. David, was your question about guerrilla warfare? I, I couldn't quite ca catch yeah, your yeah, question, yeah. my apologies. So basically all the AI weapons are connected mm. with lots of capital. Is there a kind of guerrilla world against uh, this kind of um, AI massive uh, threat which is running all over? And my example would be that a, a small balloon, a small Chinese balloon, yeah. um, uh, it's a kind of, uh, so there is a small, <laughs> a small balloon and a big plane, which, which costs much more money. Yeah. The so, yeah, yeah. office, which was opened last year for reporting and analyzing mm. non-identified objects in the sky, outer space, and mm. ocean, I think as well, yeah. And so, among them, mm. there were also balloons, yeah. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so in Gaza, balloons are often sent up to thwart drones. So it's a very low-tech system but it's hugely effective. And you might, well, you wouldn't necessarily remember, but during World War II, they had barrage balloons, which were set up to deflect uh, surveillance aircraft and indeed bombing aircraft. So very simple technology. Uh, some of the balloons in Gaza, for example, um, they're literally just filled with water or air, but they do interfere with the system's ability to relay information. So yes, I'm sure there are guerrilla systems um, and th th that's a whole other body of research which a lot of people have been engaging with. I think for me personally, uh, thinking about it legally, thinking about it through juridical discourse has helped um, because it does seem increasingly that there is momentum behind the creation of a new human right. And that human right has to address not just the fact of lethal autonomous weapons, it has to address the fact of artificial intelligence, the imbrication of artificial intelligence and its predictive function into the martial logic of a preemptive strike. The collusion there is, and indeed often remains, fatal. Maybe more one short question, please. Yeah, we have one question, or several questions from Telegram, but we'll limit ourselves to one. Uh, this is by Gurkem Ozdemir. Um, how do you manage the emotional and psychological load of your research? Are there any tips, advices, or suggestions that you can share with younger generations? Oh dear. Um, thank you for that question. How do you manage the emotional... Um, okay, so this is a huge question. I'm not necessarily going to go into it in depth. Um, so I've spoken to many, many researchers who've seen things much, much worse than I've seen. 
but because my subject area has been for the last 20 years, the Middle East, specifically post-2011 and 2015, specifically the war in Syria and the images coming out of there, yes, there is a responsibility upon you, not only to deal with those images as ethically as possible, but to deal with the ramifications of those images. Um, I, think, I think there is and should be some sort of support network that certainly deals with the impact of certain images. Personally, the research I presented here today, I hope it's not too abstracted, but I, I, I didn't show anything that was an aftermath image, for example. Um, and focusing in on the, the technicalities of these processes can often be a way of dealing with the obvious trauma associated with them. Um, so, Anthony, thank you very much uh, for the lecture, Moisha. for for discussion, and thank you to the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you, Moisa. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, we have another break, uh, and after the break, I will uh, welcome you all back for the final event in the program, the storytelling performance, Planet City, and the return of global wilderness by speculative architect and director Liam Young. Um, once again, I would like to remind you that we start at 9 p.m. sharp. We have audience online waiting, so we appreciate if you come back in time. Um, yeah, that's it. Enjoy the break. Thank you. <laughs>